Some 40 years ago, I described in a story called A Piece of Cake what it was like to find myself strapped firmly into the cockpit of my gladiator with a fractured skull and a bashed in face and a fuzzy mind while the crashed plane was going up in flames on the sands of the Western Desert. But there is an aspect of that story that I feel ought to be clarified by me, and it is this. There seems, on rereading it, to be an implication that I was shot down by enemy action. And if I remember rightly, this was inserted by the editors of an American magazine called the Saturday Evening Post, who originally bought and published it. The fact is that my crash had nothing whatsoever to do with enemy action. I was not shot down, either by another plane or from the ground. Here is what happened. I had climbed into my new gladiator at an RAF airfield called Abu Suwir on the Suez Canal and had set off alone to join 80 Squadron in the Western Desert. This was going to be my very first venture into combat territory. The date was the 19th of September, 1940. They told me to fly across the Nile Delta and land at a small airfield called Amaria near Alexandria to refuel. Then I should fly on and land again at a bomber airfield in Libya called Fuka for a second refueling. At Fuka, I was to report to the commanding officer who would tell me precisely where 80 Squadron were at that moment. And I would then fly on and join them. I landed at Fuka 55 minutes later, all these times are meticulously recorded in my logbook, and reported to the CO in his tent. He made some calls on his field telephone and then asked me for my map. 80 Squadron are now there he said, pointing to a spot in the middle of the desert about 30 miles due south of the small coastal town of Mersa Matru. Will it be easy to see? I asked him. You can't miss it, he said. You'll see the tents and about 15 gladiators parked around the place. You can spot it from miles away. I thanked him and went off to calculate my course and distance. The time was 6.15 p.m. when I took off from Fuka for 80 Squadron's landing strip. I estimated my flight time to be 50 minutes at the most. That would give me 15 or 20 minutes to spare before darkness fell, which should be ample. I flew straight for the point where the 80 Squadron airfield should have been. It wasn't there. I flew around the area to north, south, east and west, but there was not a sign of an airfield. Below me there was nothing but empty desert, and rather rugged desert at that, full of large stones and boulders and gullies. At this point, dust began to fall, and I realized that I was in trouble. My fuel was running low, and there was no way I could get back to Fuka on what I had left. I couldn't have found it in the dark anyway. The only course open to me now was to make a forced landing in the desert and make it quickly before it was too dark to see. I skimmed low over the boulder-strewn desert, searching for just one small strip of reasonably flat sand on which to land. I knew the direction of the wind, so I knew precisely the direction that my approach would take. But where, oh where, was the one little patch of desert that was clear of boulders and gullies and lumps of rock? There simply wasn't one. It was nearly dark now. I had to get down somehow or other. I chose a piece of ground that seemed to me to be as boulder-free as any, and I made an approach. My wheels touched down. I throttled back and prayed for a bit of luck. I didn't get it. My undercarriage hit a boulder and collapsed completely, and the gladiator buried its nose in the sand at what must have been about 75 miles an hour. My injuries in that bust-up came from my head being thrown forward violently against the reflector site when the plane hit the ground in spite of the fact that I was strapped tightly, as always, into the cockpit. And apart from the skull fracture, the blow pushed my nose in and knocked out a few teeth and blinded me completely for days to come. It is odd that I can remember very clearly quite a few of the things that followed seconds after the crash. Obviously, I was unconscious for some moments, but I must have recovered my senses very quickly, because I can remember hearing a mighty whoosh as the petrol tank in the port wing exploded, followed almost at once by another mighty whoosh as the starboard tank went up in flames. I could see nothing at all, and I felt no pain. All I wanted was to go gently off to sleep and to hell with the flames. But soon a tremendous heat around my legs galvanized my soggy brain into action. With great difficulty I managed to undo first my seat straps, and then the straps of my parachute. And I can even remember the desperate effort it took to push myself upright in the cockpit and roll out head first onto the sand below. I began, very, very slowly, to drag myself away from the awful hotness. And this took a long time, an enormous effort, but in the end the temperature all around me became bearable. When that happened, I collapsed and went to sleep.